This week's episode is sponsored by Ryan at Change. If you are looking to get involved in e-commerce and build a successful online business, then check out my good friend Ryan, who I have been working with the last few years and attended many events and retreats all around the world, spending time with members who are making some serious money. I have been promoting Ryan for a while now because I believe in what he does and not only has he helped and supported me build my own businesses, but I have seen firsthand how he helps and supports his members take their businesses to new levels and give them financial freedom. So if you are interested in getting into e-commerce and building successful online stores, then message Ryan on his Instagram at RyanJB to join his winning team. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. <laughs> Today's guest, we've got Johnny Chang. Johnny boy, how are you? Good, 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 man. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Pleasure to have you on. Involved in LA gangs. Changed your life. In and out of prison, though. A yeah. lot of destruction, a lot of pain, a lot of some serious conversations to get to where you are. Yeah. Seen many of your interviews now. Unbelievable. This is the kind of stuff that I love to talk about and get on because there's motivation at the end of the pain and that's what it's about but first and foremost how are we brother we're good we're good man appreciate you for you know getting me out here and yeah definitely a lot of pain a lot of chaos that you know i left behind but very thankful as we're looking you know past everything now it's just all positivity so good amen, brother. amen. Yeah. before we get into everything though i always like to go back to the start with my guests get a bit of understanding about you where you grew up and how it all began sure uh so i grew up in in la uh east side of la which is los angeles um we call it the san gabriel valley it's uh really really predominantly asian um now you know when i was growing up it was about 50 50 now it's like 80 80 20 um the other half was hispanic so we grew up right alongside the the mexicans um salvadorians you know hispanic people um and yeah it was it was very poverty stricken at that time i grew up in some project housing um i don't know if you guys have that out there in scotland but yeah, yeah they, they call them the flats out there or whatever right so um yeah same thing government funded housing gangs drugs violence everywhere and um we were living me my brother my mom and my my father uh typical traditional chinese household father was dictator ran everything but at the same time mother was very submissive very peaceful you know first one to get out of the bed first one to get inside of the bed as well uh, before he came back so um you know just very submissive and my father was a drunk you know as an alcoholic um, beat on me, beat on my, my, my brother, beat on my mom. So he had a lot of inner demons as well at that time we didn't recognize. Um, but yeah, so we grew up in that type of environment, pushed me to kind of join gangs at a very early, early age. Um, so I was 12 years old when I, when I joined my first gang. What were you like at school? Uh, bad. I was, I was a knucklehead and I was fighting with people, um, stealing, you know, ditching, um, just doing a lot of bad stuff, even at the age of 12 years old. Yeah. Who forced you into the gangs? Your dad? Uh, my dad was, yeah, I would say it was, was your a dad big, a gang member. He actually wasn't a gang member, but he was very like a street guy where in, in, cause he, we're Chinese, but he's born in Korea, uh, due to my grandparents, you know, fleeing the war in China, you know, at that time it was a communist regime. Everybody was just running everywhere to get out and they were erasing their history before their eyes, you know? Um, but my father was, was in Korea, was a fighter, you know, he's had always been fighting on the streets and they kind of faced a little bit of oppression over there too, being that they're Chinese, but living in Korea. So yeah, he fought a lot too. He fought a lot. Yeah. Yeah. How many 
is it Chinese gangs or was it a mixture with LA gangs? But how 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 many gangs? Because she says it's fifty fifty. Yeah. Then so how mixed was it? It was pretty mixed. Uh, we had a lot of different gangs. We had Chinese gangs, we had Vietnamese gangs. In general, we had a lot of different Asian gangs, and then we had predominantly Hispanic. They they dominated. They've been there since some of them since the thirties and forties in that area. So you know, we just started pushing in there. I would say mid to late eighties. And then in my era, you know, it was about late 90s, early 2000s. At that time, there was already some gangs that had been established, like my gang. Yeah. When did you start getting into trouble? Uh, at the age of 10, I started getting into trouble. I was fighting and stuff. Um, you know, I did stuff like when I was seven, eight years old, stealing here and there. Nothing too violent. The violence started coming around 10, 11, 12 years old. I was extremely violent. You know, I had like, you know, I already stabbed somebody, I beat somebody up. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff. And at 12, um, you know, I was already kind of like shooting at people. So How many members were in this gang? A lot. At that time, we have different. So it's an umbrella and then there's different cliques, as we call them, or different sides. So easily, easily in that in that time, like anywhere from like 800 to 1,000 members for sure. Who was the top boy? Um, the top guy, yeah. um, the, there was, uh, there was different, different factions with like different, what we call heads. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, there was a lot of people, um, it's usually named by their, so the sides are named by the, the heads. So I'm from ocean side. So there's like ocean, you know, a guy named ocean, there's sunny, there's, you know, stuff like that. So it just depends on who, which side you're at, which area you're at. That was the head at that time. How hey, well, old were these people running these gangs? Oh, it, it depended. I mean, some of them were, you know, 30s. Some of them were late 20s. I mean, it was around like 20, mid 20s to I would say late to mid 30s. What does it take to get in one of these gangs? Uh, for that, you had to do like a put on, we call an initiation. So they would beat you up, like similar to a lot of LA gangs. If, if you say put on, they understand that they beat you up for a set amount of time just to test your grit to see if you'll, you, you, you could fight and if you could handle your own. And then the second part of that would be putting in work, which means, you know, going out and proving to yourself, like maybe it would be shooting a rival gang member, robbing somebody, just doing dirt for the gang. Gang, like elevating the gang to a different status. What's the gang called? Watching. Watching? Yeah, wa <laughs> it's W-A-H-C-H-I-N-G. It means actually in Mandarin, Chinese youth or like young Chinese, if you translate it literally. What sort of age group? What's the youngest person who can join these gangs? Uh, it, it, it ranges. I mean, we've had people who were like 11, we've had 12 years old. I would say around 12 to 15 would be like the, the average rate, uh, average age, I'm sorry, that would join the gang. It's sad as well, though, that people in their 30s and 40s are telling young kids to shoot and stab to get yeah. into gangs. Like, mm -hmm. But again, when you that's all you know. You tend to see a lot of those kids have come from broken homes or their father's beating them. That's only probably family they felt they had. Was that your sort of... Yeah. Motive behind it because you you were scared of your dad or scared of the beatings all the time where you never really had a family. Yeah, it was more like a pseudo family that I was looking for. And then, I, you know, you see it on the streets. You see them driving the nice cars. You see the prestige, you know, of that, that, that the allure of that lifestyle was a big thing. When I saw, you know, gang members just a little bit older than me pulling out, you know, wads of cash and you're coming from a place where you don't make money, you know, your parents don't make money. They're making more money than your parents. You know, that really had a such a big pull and like it attracted me to that life. And then on top of that, they had respect. You know, everywhere they drove, people were like, like noticed them. They stuck out, and um, yeah, in my early on, I was like very quick to pick that up and and realize that I don't want to be going home, getting beat up by my dad. You know, going home to this family that's like broken. You know, I'd rather be um, outside on the streets. So every time I try to stay away from from home, um, you know, but I, of course being. 12 years old you still have to come home you know every night and um that was the gang was kind of an outlet for me to to run away from the family basically and go to that family you know this new family what was it like hurting someone for the first time um hurting it, it was um 
Honestly, at first, I, it was it was kind of scary. You know, you feel like, dang, like, you know, subconsciously, subconsciously that you shouldn't be doing this. But there was also, a, honestly, an excitement that came with it. It was as if I could kind of release my stress as well, you know, because I was getting hurt so much. And, you know, my first fight, for example, um, you, you know, you get tense, you feel that that feeling of like jittery feeling. But after a while, you know, you start to win and then you start to see, get notoriety, you know, get notoriety. You know, people start to notice you, man, you're fighting. This guy could fight good. So it went from, you know, at first to being really scared. And then you start to embrace it. You really start to like it. And you start to recognize, like, I, I learned early on that violence kind of is, is almost like a tool and a language. You know, like everyone, it's a universal language. If you do, if you're violent, people kind of understand like, oh, this guy means business um leave them alone you know so i always kind of focused on being the most violent person so that i didn't have to deal with like really speaking to people you know and 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 having to communicate with them you know i would just be like if you don't listen to what i say i'm gonna just communicate in this way violently you know mm -hmm. so it was it was pretty bad so to join a biker gang it's like a prospect you've got to do a lot of shit to kind of get in so that's the same tools that you have to do to get into a gang in LA. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely levels to it. People don't just let you walk in and share all of their <clears> secrets because if you're somebody who's an informant or a snitch or a rat, as they say, they could be sharing the wrong information to the wrong person. So um, they really do put you through this test, you know, and they teach you the rules and regulations. You know, my OGs, my 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 big homies, as we call them, um, our leaders taught us actually very meticulously what is it? What is allowed? What's not allowed? You know, it was just a, it's a whole different ecosystem almost. You know? Like the mafia? I would say. Yeah, yeah. We were very organized people. We're known as the Chinese triads. You know, in our areas, people are like, oh, these watching guys, they're different. They're not just like a regular street gang. It was almost like a hybrid. We had the street aspect, but we also had the business <clears throat> aspect as well. I've spoke to a lot of gang members all around the world. The triads always seem to be never let anybody else in. Other gangs, it's all multicultural, but yeah. the triads seem to have been their own. Like, was there any white people, black people inside this gang? <laughs> it was very rare to have them. And if they did, they would at least have to be someone we've known from like early on, like, like pampers, as we say, growing up as kids. But yeah, it was very rare. It was very rare. It was mainly, if you're Chinese, I mean, the gang is called Chinese youth, so 90% of the time you have to be a, a young Chinese person. But I mean, I've seen it, I'll be honest, I've seen people who were like white in the gang. Um, and, and I've seen like different race, like Vietnamese people, maybe some Japanese people. But for the most part, majority, yes, it was always Chinese, very exclusive as well. What was it like when you got into the gang? Um, it was pretty, pretty crazy. At first, um, you know, they really took care of us. And um, honestly, they never stopped taking care of us, you know. But uh, when I had gotten my first money, you know, making my money, them showing me how to use a gun, things like that. Uh, at that time, I was thinking that these were really good things because they're teaching you protection. They're giving you financial stability. They're giving you an income almost. And um, yeah, it was really, really good in, in the beginning. But then, of course, with the prison and things like that, you start to kind of recognize that you, you, you lose yourself. And a lot of families are torn apart because of gangs, you know. So, What age did you learn how to use the gun? 12. Very, very quickly. Um at that time, I think, I mean, America in general is known for having guns and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I started to learn like a month into into it. And on my third month, I was I, I caught my first case, as they say, and, and um, I was arrested, you know, and from there I did four years, um, you know, in California Youth Authority. Now, Youth Authority is different than like regular juvenile hall. You have to be admitted into the Youth Authority. They, it's it's almost like a mental hospital. It's an in, in, insane asylum, if you will, for like the worst of the worst, worst juvenile offenders. What was that feeling? Crazy. Yeah, that place, um, you're around like, man, you're around like anyone from, 12 all the way up to like 18 years old and some people even 25 they'll have juvenile murder and life in there but um yeah my first night there i was like threatened to be stabbed i mean um i've seen people get raped i've seen these are kids doing this to other kids i've seen kids get stabbed in the neck kids get strangled 
big old brawls, fights. I mean, the fights was every day, but just a lot of crazy things. And I, I feel like YA, California Youth Authority, was worse than prison because you couldn't hide behind like a car, as we say, uh, behind, behind a race. Um, California, it's kind of more racial. Asians go with the Asians, you know, blacks with the blacks, white with the whites. In California Youth Authority, it wasn't really like that. Yes, they went with Asians, but if somebody was to fight you and they were another race, like you have to defend yourself. Otherwise, they're going to take you for everything you got. And then other people all around you is going to take you for what you got. So you really had to fight every single day, you know, and that's why I literally learned to fight. Lost a couple fights, won a couple fights, but you start to learn you know, and you learn how to like, just be a monster, you know, honestly, like take everything as disrespect. If somebody says something to you, two seconds, you take off on them. I mean, if you don't, then everybody looks at you like you're a punk and a bitch and stuff like that. So what did you get charged with? Uh, I got charged originally with um, robbery and, and kidnapping, but they dumbed it down luckily to dissuading a witness for the benefit of a gang. So kind of like witness intimidation, if you will. And yeah, they gave me four years for that. Our um, gang was already on like the FBI list. You know, they were already trying to have gang injunctions on us. They were trying to RICO us. I'm not sure if you know what RICO is. Yeah, RICO, I've spoken to enough on mafia to understand. Right. Can you explain the RICO though? Yeah. For people who don't know. Yeah, yeah. So it's when it's a federal indictment where this they, they go after you because you're so big. You're this conglomerate that's making money and you just have your hand in everything. And they come specifically for you. They have operations, Homeland Security. Security, FBI, CIA, they all work together to come and like basically knock you off and 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 really attack that <clears throat> one gang or one organization like they did the mafia, you know, and they it's all federal stuff. A lot of it is federal stuff. Also state stuff, but mostly federal. So you're twelve years old at this time? Yeah. What's your mom saying when you're at court? Um, you know, they were shocked because they didn't know I was gangbanging. Um, you know, I was, I was always bringing a change of clothes everywhere that I went and they, they asked my mom, I remember, you know, what was your son? Do you remember what your son was wearing? What Johnny was wearing when he, when he went out and they're like, oh yeah, you know, blue jeans, gray sweater. This episode is sponsored by Fire Away Pizza, the fastest growing pizza company in the UK with over 150 stores. With their fresh quality ingredients and unique pizzas, they will have you coming back for more. Use code JAMES20 for 20% off. That's JAMES20 for 20% off. They said no, he was wearing a red and black flannel, you know, baggy black pants. So red and black is our gang colors and, you know, Cortez shoes. All the L.A. people know that Cortezes are like the the, the gang banging shoe back then, you know. Um, L.A. people, we like to be a little loud. We like to be a little flashy, you know. So um, my mom was kind of shocked. Like your, your, your son is potentially, no, he's not potentially, he's in a gang. And you guys have to prepare for that, you know. So when I got caught that's when my mom actually found out all of the dirt that i was doing what i was being charged with i mean i i remember seeing her face even in court like she was shocked she was just like yo how like he's a monster you know how i, I, I didn't raise a kid like this she didn't know anything she didn't know anything what was it like the first day walking in the kind of yo's back then like were you scared absolutely you know um I was scared because they were, you know, kind of prepared. I was on the phone with people and they were already kind of telling us people in the tank as well. Um, you know, in the court were like explaining to us that, hey, this is probably going to be a serious thing. You know, kidnapping is a, a very big thing in, in, in you know, the, the States. So, um, yeah, people do a long time. So when I heard that, you know, at 12, you're going to go to this place that's crazy and and you know you might be doing a very long time i was kind of like scared you know but at the same time it was weird it was an opportunity for me to like rise like i saw that as a kid too like if i just take the rap which i did then because there was there was like six of us involved you know it wasn't just one person so i was like i'll take the rap because i'm the youngest now i didn't think honestly i would do a lot of time i thought maybe i would do like two years a year but they ended up giving me four so that's when I was like really shocked, you know, and, um, you know, they give you a parole date. You don't have to do all four, but 
I didn't understand, unbeknownst to me, when you go to YA, you're going to fight. So that means you're going to catch these level Bs, which is uh, write-ups, you know, and when you do these level Bs, the more you do them, and you're going to catch them every day because you have to fight every day. It, it literally makes you max out your time, which means, yeah, they give you a date to go home, let's say in two years, but most people don't make that. Most people, if they say four years, you're doing four years, probably even more, just depending on how much work you put in. So I had to do the full four years. Yeah. Did you have to grow up fast then when you had to be 12 years old? My son is 13. Yeah. Fuck me. But yeah. if he swears, I go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's yeah. crazy to think just a young boy, innocent, to then being shown that life of willing to kill willing to die, sure. willing to do a full year in prison for, for what? Yeah. So your idea was take the blame, rise through the ranks, not snitch. Did you get offered a deal uh, at such a young age? Or was there no deal on the table? No, of course. Of course <clears> they <throat> offered a deal, you know, because they wanted me to, you know, rat out. Snitch the, on the big ones? Yeah. And I was like, I'm not doing that, you know. And um, yeah, it was it was crazy, you know, being 12. Yes, you had to grow up fast, you know. Um, I was more afraid, I'll be honest, of me dying. Like, if I was to snitch, I knew I was going to die. Like, <laughs> they're going to let me out, and then these people are known for, like, shooting people. So I'm like, I'd rather not die. Like, I'd rather... So I, 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 I understood the fear that was ingrained in me, um, which kind of brought loyalty, you know, based off of the fear. But um, at the end of the day, I really also didn't want to go out like that like i i had finally felt like i found hope as twisted as as that sounds i found hope in this type of lifestyle and i was like you know they love me you know this is my family so i don't want to like it was like 50 50 like i don't want to die i don't think they'll kill me and as long as i play my cards right which is take the blame take the fault then i just saw the positive in everything little did i know i didn't calculate the mental stress and like emotional instability that it would cause me like ptsd and all this crazy stuff that would come out of that but i just saw it as very like i only see the beginning and the end of it i didn't really think anything through and i was i mean I was 12 I don't think I could I was very impulsive you know so yeah what's the worst thing you've seen while you're in that prison at 12 when at 12 I'd seen the first time heard and seen people getting turned out which means getting raped and that was like crazy that was something that you won't forget you know and then um I've seen people getting stabbed like like all kinds of ways like they make you know shanks they make razors all kinds of stuff so i had seen that and that's something really like tra traumatic obviously for a 12 year old but to see the youth doing it to other youth where i was at was nellis y which is pretty one of the it's very well known they closed it down thank god but it was very known it was known uh well known for the violence Honestly, I've even seen correctional officers like raping the kids too. And that was crazy. You know, the very people that are supposed to watch over us and, and maintain order were doing crazy stuff, making us fight each other. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It was crazy. So the prison officers were just as bad? Uh, I would say probably worse. Yeah. What are you thinking then when you're seeing prison officers rape young kids? Honestly that's the one thing that when I went in there, you get laced up, which means, you know, uh, it's, it's a slang where they come and they tell you the rules. And somebody who's been in there tells you the rules and regulations. And the first thing they taught me was forget about your family. Why would you say something like that to a 12 year old? You know, forget about your family. Um, you're never going home. You know, this type of lifestyle, like even if we get out on the streets, we're going to come right back in. This is what I was told as a kid. So, when I thought about that, I'm like, wow, this is, um, yeah, it was, it was just, you just had to prepare mentally to like be a monster almost, you know, I felt like I cultivated that mindset at a very young age to just not care about anybody else and just like self-preservation to the fullest, you know. How did you survive that? Because you're the youngest there. Yeah. So how do you survive that? What do you feel as if you had to do more damage to try and prove a point or how does it work at such a young age how was your method of thinking yeah it was just like no matter what happens like don't you can't let them 
you know, take advantage of you in any way, physically, emotionally, mentally. So everyone was always on high. Like, I felt like I probably had high blood pressure even at that age because everything around you, like it just, it, like you just act. So nothing, you, you don't, you don't give yourself time to think. You have to react off of everything. If you feel disrespected, um, you take off, which means you just punch them. It doesn't matter what it is. Punch them, stab them, do whatever. You have to establish that I'm not going to take anything from you. If you say anything to me, um, and I feel it just a little bit, we're going to have a problem. We're going to fight. We're going to do that. And really, believe it or not, the more you act like that, the more crazy you act, people start to respect that and be like, okay, this guy's not going to take anything from us. We can't just take his food. We can't just take his commissary. We can't take his clothes. So we just got to kind of leave him alone. So you did have to have that mindset of like that trigger, you know, like hairpin trigger mindset. Right. How did, so see when you're doing that then, going through the ranks, did you have other gang members in prison with you? Mm -hmm. How many of you? Uh, there was a few of us from my from my neighborhood as well. Did that um, make it easier? It, it did. It did. <clears throat> yeah. Um, luckily, you know, all throughout the the California system, people know this. You know, watching um, our uh, us especially, we we're all throughout the area. You know, all the blacks know us. That's I would say that's the the bell that rings the loudest is is when you go out there is is watching. You know, um, so yeah, it, it did make it a lot easier. But still, it also kind of made it harder in some some instances because, um, you know, you also have the other enemies, you have the, the opposition, and they are also like hating on us too, right? So um, it, they were gangbanging on us as well. It was a lot of gangbanging, you know, your side, my side, fighting each other. Um, every everybody who was a rival gang member we'd have to fight them basically so if, if it was a new person you're getting new people every day so you'd have to fight them every single day now this was a youth authority it was just fighting all day um and then when you get to prison it's different it, it's i had to really learn how to program as they say because when i went to prison now you, it's a whole shift it's a it's a culture shock almost you don't the same guy that you fought in ya the same guy that shot at your friend or you shot at their friend, maybe even murdered their brother or whoever, they now have to be like buddy, buddy with you because of it's a race thing now. So it's race against race. We have different cars, you know, like vehicle cars. So there's the black car, the Asian car or the other car, as they say. And you have to now click up. It really is a race war. And there isn't one on one fighting in prison where it's like, oh, you have a problem with me and you're black and I'm Asian. No, we're all going to fight all blacks against all Asians. It's going to be like that. So. It was very different. It was more of a numbers game now. As you become an adult and older and you go to these state penitentiaries, that's that that was something that was really hard for me to grasp, I would say the first year to like two years, because my mindset was the YA mindset. I had to like kind of tone it down a little bit because if you were in a rival gang, we'd have to fight. So I went from that environment to like, okay, now he's in a rival gang, but wait, 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 I got to step on the brakes. We got to watch each other's back. It's like, it doesn't make sense, you know, so. Did you get moved from the four year sentence to an adult prison or did you finish the four in the same place? Yeah, so from, after I finished my four years in prison, um, I got out and caught my second case. How, so I how got long? out uh, about 67 days. So two months and a, and a week. And um, what was the feeling like getting out? Did you feel as if you had earned your stripes? Did you feel as if you were an adult? Well, right when I got out, I'll be honest, I felt a little bit of a, like a sense of accomplishment because I'm like, damn, I made it out. And everyone knows when you go to the Y, like Y, people are like, oh, this guy is gangster because he went to like the top of the top. It's like university for criminals almost, you know. So when I walked out, I did have a little bit of a puffed up chest, but that made me arrogant and very reckless because of that. And on top of that, you're crazy. So like you're doing much more crazy things that normal people aren't really used to you know, but you're living in that environment. So it's very normal for you. So you rise very quickly and people start to recognize who you actually are. So that's why I couldn't even stay out for more than two months because my, I was reckless. I was crazy. So, um, yeah, I did feel a sense. It was a mixture of emotions, but like happy, but also crazy, but also like very arrogant. So it's just like all together. Did you feel untouchable? Yes. 100%. I felt untouchable. And, um, you know, and that's why I did what I did, which was my second case. Is the first case a felony? 
uh, first case. Well, even at that age? At that age, yes, of course, of course. Is but it three felonies and then life? So that's that's after you um, after eighteen, right? A oh, lot so of that these doesn't count. Yeah. So a lot of these, um, you know, fel juvenile felonies, unless you're try tried as an adult, mm -hmm. um, most of it can get sealed. You know, um, not necessarily expunged, but sealed because you're you're a juvenile. I don't know how it is out here in UK or wherever, but in in the states that happens. But I didn't even make it to that. I, 67 days, I get locked up for a shooting, a freeway shooting, car to car shooting. And they charged me with two counts of assault with deadly weapon because there was people in the car. So at first it was attempted murder, obviously. Uh, I pled out. So that's when I was like, okay, I, I admit, give me whatever time. They gave me 10 years, 85%. So what that means is I have to do a, a mandatory minimum of 85% of those 10 years, uh, depending on my behavior in prison. I either do it all in prison or I get out and parole after eight years and some change, which is what happened with me. How many people were in the car? Uh, that I remember there was two. Um, they claimed there was three but I remember only two people. What was that feeling when you're, you're driving and shooting at the same time? Uh, it was pretty crazy because when I, that was a, a almost an everyday thing that was happening in the San Gabriel Valley, these freeway shootings, because you know, you're driving and you look over and you see the rival gang member and it and it's on site, which means you see them, you know, they had shot at your friends, you had shot at their friends. So nine times out of 10, especially Asian gangs in my area, they're all carrying guns, they're all packing. So um, yeah, I was carrying two and um, I saw them and it was just, again, instinct, like, oh, that's them. I, I recognize who they are. Boom, 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 and start shooting. And it was really like, almost a natural thing for us, you know, cause you, you see that happening, you hear about this happening and, you know, but for me, I was, it was pretty normal actually, as crazy as that sounds. How did you get caught? Um, so <clears throat> somebody behind, I guess, caught my license plate number and basically reported they, they sent out a warrant for my arrest, had to go on the run a little bit. Um, but yeah, I got caught uh, eventually. Shooting from a car that was registered to you? Yeah. That's fucking crazy. I know, that's, I know. That's what I'm saying. You that's deserve how, to get caught, bro. Right, exactly. That's <laughs> yeah. how impulsive we were as kids. You know what I mean? Um, it wasn't really, re it wasn't registered to me, but it was registered to someone in my family, you know, which was my dad. And um, yeah, I, I yeah, it was bad. It was stupid, nonetheless. Is, is yeah. that why you pleaded to it straight away and admitted your guilt? Yeah, well, did, not, did they try and charge your dad? No, 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 no. Because that's they, what they do here. Whoever's the car registered yeah, to, yeah, yeah. if I pick someone up and I've got 10 kilo of coke, yeah. they're in the car with it. But if they get pulled over, it's me, it gets charged because yeah. it's in my fucking property. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he actually had a warrant for his arrest. <laughs> your dad? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he went and was like, what the, f and then I was like, fuck. So after that, we had to make like a little bit of a decision and um, yeah, kind of basically, you know, went in. But um, um, how, yeah, that was that was crazy. How old were you then? Seventeen. I was sixteen and some change, almost seventeen. Yeah. What are you thinking when you get ten stretch? Uh, honestly, I was relieved because they were giving me like crazy numbers at first, you know. And I didn't. Now I know it was like a lot of them, kind of like bluff, you know, like oh, I'm gonna give you, you know, thirty-seven years or whatever. They try to charge me first with like you know, 19 years for this case and then, and then 10 for this. It was like adding up to like a crazy number. So when you hear that, like your heart sinks, you know, and you're like, dang, I didn't even like shoot nobody. Like I didn't even hit anybody technically. No one got injured, but doesn't matter. You know, they were like the attempted is what matters. So um, I was just being told people all in my ear, older homies, you know, I had a PD at that time, a public defender, and which I know now he just wanted to get the, court you know case done he said if you get 15 years um you should take the deal you know it's a really good deal you know you shot at two people and you're only getting 15 years like that should and you're from ya so that means they're gonna pull that up and be like look at him he's mentally unstable his rico history with the gang i mean you're gonna lose and i'm like dang so if they give you any deal take it so at first they actually gave me a deal i think it was like 18 you know, and I was like, nah, hell no, nah, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm going to get out when I'm in my 30s, you know, I'm not cool with that. But then they dropped it down to 12. And then I was like, oh, I started contemplating around 12. And then the next day they came back with 10. And I said, 
shoot it, just give it to me, you know, and signed and, and did what I did. And, and I was shipped off to, to prison. What prison did you go to? I first went to Lancaster State Prison. So there's a, a receptionary period where you do about 90 days, three months in prison. They put you in this place where it's called reception and they kind of hold you there, see how you're going to interact. They're, they're figuring out where to place you. And from there, I was shipped out to Ironwood State Prison. Yeah. What are you thinking then? Still a kid, 16 years old, 10 years in an adult prison. Yeah. <clears throat> Is that a felony charge then? Yes, yes. Two counts, two counts, two strikes. So, so that's two strikes straight away, one more, it's life. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. 16? So, yeah. Yeah. And um, it was crazy. You know, it was, um, I really, I'll be honest, I thought I was going to die in prison just because I'm like, there's a saying that they, they'll strike you out for spitting on the street, you know, something as small as spitting on the street. Obviously, that's not true, but it's basically you're living your whole life walking on eggshells type of stuff, you know. So um, I was just prepared to kind of live in there, you know, um, for the rest of my life or, or even die in there, you know. So um, again, that YA mentality came out of me like, well, you're not going to make it out. Nobody gives a shit about you. Um, so just live the way that you want to live you know if you want to stab people in there you want to hurt people i mean this is what you signed up for you have nothing else to stand for you know no one's gonna pity you're gonna cry who's who's coming for you nobody's coming for you you know you just have to handle your own you know and i learned that at a very young age too 16 17 i was able to grasp that concept yeah. what's your mum saying at that point did you totally block off your feelings and emotions with family yeah so you it wouldn't affect you but again it's your mother same as myself when i was doing shit back in the day it's it's the pain and the misery and the trauma that you caused them sure and for what right right um you know my mom was we never really spoke believe it or not she was always siding with my dad so always had a, a very big um heart she, of resentment was she scared him. of your dad she was very terrified of him yeah mm -hmm. and um yeah so she she just we, we didn't really speak um she would tell me things like you know i'm sorry you know that dad hit you and i'm like mom like i would not allow her to like get into the core of my heart because i knew that that was a sign of weakness you can't be crying in prison you know people are going to see that and there's a lot of predators in there so um i would just like it would be points where i wouldn't even visit my mom and, and this is wrong but um i would you know she would drive about two two and a half hours to get to where i was at and there's times where like i wouldn't want to hear her speaking about you know, the past and like how wrong she did me and this, cause I would, I would then get emotional. So there's times where I would reject her visits and stuff like that. You know, it was very hard now that I think about it, um, to do that to my own mom, you know, but, um, she tried, she tried to, you know, she was Buddhist. So she would give me like little chants and stuff like that. You know, we're traditionally we're raised Buddhist, um, uh, most Chinese households, but, um, yeah, she, she just really like try to lead me correctly um in there spiritually you know giving me these buddhist chants prayers and stuff like that and um yeah yeah what was it like in the adult prison how did you get through it again was it did you have gang members in with you yes 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 every yard that i went to thankfully i think was a blessing we had homies people from my neighborhood um different sides different factions but same umbrella same gang you know so uh, it was it was good actually. They they welcomed me in, um, and I started to believe it or not, really meet a lot of good people in prison. I met. I, I thought it was gonna be all crazy, which it is, but there were actually a lot of people who were mature. There were people who were very disciplined, believe it or not. And California prisons are very respectful. Uh, they're ran almost very militant, where if you step behind somebody you say excuse me you know things like that so i was actually taught to clean my cell i had a lot of like physical endurance because you're doing calisthenics burpees you got to be very innovative about the way you work because they're not giving prisoners barbells and you know dumbbells will kill each other so you have to like find out ways to do burpees and you know upside down push-ups and so so you my workout routine my regimen was really good i mean but i think mentally i was just there was nothing feeding my mental you know, um, uh, everything was more physical, working out, you know, running, um, reading, I mean, was, was accessible, but 
I mean, I didn't even have a GED education at that time. I got my GED in prison. I did anger management in prison. I did counseling in prison. They had these programs, um, but I couldn't get rid of this emptiness that I felt inside of my heart. And I thought that emptiness was just something that was a result of being in prison. But what really was crazy was when I got out, I still had that emptiness and that void inside of my heart. You know? How many gangs are in the adult prison? Oh, there's, it's countless. There's so many different gangs. I mean, there's people from different areas, Bay Area, North, North, you know, North, Northern California car. I mean, there's, there's people from like San Diego, which is really Southern on the border of, you know, Tijuana, Mexico, basically. I mean, there's all, <laughs> to name, to number them, it's, it's, there's too many. Yeah. What sort of stuff were you seeing in the adult prison? Obviously the youth. Yeah. It's a different ball game. Everybody's trying to make a name for themselves. Yeah. But the adult prison, like you say, it's more regimented, but there's still a lot of bad stuff goes in in the American jails. What sort of stuff were you seeing? Um, same thing except for everything except for the rapes, you know, and, and, and that was not allowed actually in California prisons. It caused a lot of problems. So thankfully yeah, we're that's not some gay shit that yeah. though. <laughs> Isn't it, bro? <laughs> no, I mean yes. fucking gay bastards like <laughs> Who the fuck does that? Do you know what I mean? So-called gangbangers, gangsters, right, right. and they're fucking raping kids. Like, that's sick. Do that you know what I mean? Rough. Obviously, that's why their heads are fucked. Their sexualities yeah, yeah, yeah. must be all over the place. Of but course. to do that to any human being is sick, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're and that, taking their manhood and... and yeah, their soul, like stripping their soul. Yeah. That's the worst thing you can do to any... Listen, people kill people. We get it, but to rape another... As young kids, yeah. YOs, raping young boys... And, yeah. That affects and scars them for life. For sure. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. we we seen still a lot of violence though in the adult prison. For sure, <clears throat> for sure. There was now race riots. I think death was more prominent in prison than it was in YA. Um, because, you know, you can control kids, you know, I mean, you know, but uh, I saw the calculated like meticulousness of like murder and planned out things and organization it was pretty crazy you know seeing how people would literally go to war this is not like a joke it's like spartacus you know it's like they're all going to war and wearing extra layers to prevent stabbings i mean you know putting you know the rules and regulations the books you know um, just all all kinds of crazy ways and they're really fighting you know for their lives in there so yeah it was pretty crazy when was the first time someone gave you advice because you know in that life you try and be a little soldier and do the sure. wrong things to to make out as if you are somebody sure. when really you're losing yourself more but there's never any guidance when was the first time someone says to you look what you're doing is fucking wrong you're yeah. stupid what are you doing it for yeah. the, when was that did that advice ever come yeah it did uh it came about two years into it i i, I had a cellmate older asian gentleman and you know he was um actually a lot older he was like in his 50s almost 60 and he's he just was really smart you know he was from san francisco he was from my neighborhood too but like, but like an older generation and he told me he's like you know johnny you you have a lot of anger and i noticed that you you overthink a lot like you're an overthinker you know so uh what helped me bro and he's like kind of explaining you know um is to to get in the, the books bro you got to read a little bit and you can kind of release a lot of that mental tension from reading you know, your mind can go anywhere, bro. So if you read, it kind of lets you focus a little bit and you get some reps in mentally, you know. So um, that was the first time. And I, I'm glad I took his advice because I, I was I used to think reading was like stupid. Like who who, who, who would want to sit there and look at a book and like, you know, read. But I noticed that reading allowed me to utilize my imagination. It allowed me to kind of take my mind off of all of these intrusive thoughts that were flooding me every day and just laser focus on the storyline, you know, what's going on in this book. And so I started to kind of find a way of like reading. And I noticed that my vocabulary, comprehension, everything was improving as well. He's the same guy that told me that I should take anger management. He's like, bro, it's free. You know, he's the same guy who was like, go and do the GED stuff. I mean, it's all free in here. Dental work, you know, I mean, the, 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 I mean, sadly, the taxpayers are paying for that. So they're like free dental, free everything. So take advantage of that. And I, I was for the first time able to see like, this guy's a lifer, meaning he's never going to get out of prison, but he's found a way to thrive even in that prison ecosystem, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but you, you, this is a vessel. So 
even though it can be boxed in, mm. they can't box this in. Mm -hmm. You can be anywhere you want. Listen, you don't want to be in a cell, but he's obviously found a route of education. He can think where he wants to be in life. No matter if he's caged up, you can only use what you've got in those circumstances and he's used them to his potential. Like, wh why did you listen to him? Um, I think just because the Asian culture in general, we're very, um, we respect our elders, right? So um, it was just kind of ingrained in us. And and he he had a genuine heart. Like I could, I could feel it, you know, he wasn't sitting there trying to take advantage of me. Like I didn't feel like there was any benefit for him telling me to go and get my GED, <laughs> for him telling me to better my life didn't really have any added benefit, you know? So he kind of taught me like uh, what a, a, a OG should be like, how, how someone cares about other people. He showed me how to have compassion on others and think for others just a little bit. And yeah, like you said, you know, I saw that although he was in prison and he had a worse, um, you know, situation than I was, he's gonna die in there. Um, he was happier than I was. He was more peaceful than I was. And so I was able to see that there's something different. And I was able to notice that his heart, his mind can go anywhere. It wasn't boxed in. Yes, physically he was, you know, but emotionally, mentally, he was free. And that was crazy to me. You know? What was he in for? Uh, he was in there for murder. Yeah, double murder. So he killed two people. It was a botched robbery, basically. Yeah. It's mad doing it. Yeah. Shit. So how you, when did you start working with Finn? When you, and what, sorry, first of all, what's a GED for people who don't know? Yeah. So it's kind of the high school equivalent. It's the equivalent to a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, you're not crossing the stage and going to high school. It's like a packet. You take a test, but it's basically the, the equivalent to a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. So did you start wanting to change while you? in the adult prison doing a 10? Yeah, I would say I was searching. Um, he piqued my interest, but I still had that 50-50 heart, if you will. Half of my heart was like, nah, I can't look weak. I can't really like be all goody too sure. I had to walk that fine line, both sides of the fence, if you will, because um, I knew that people would take advantage of me um you know if i was to show any type of weakness but um also inside deep inside i didn't want to live like that way anymore i was like man i'm not an animal you know like yeah i live like an animal but i'm still a human being like i i don't want to be angry i don't it's funny like i don't want to be angry but i'm angry all the time you know i don't want to have these murderous thoughts i hate having these murderous thoughts but like i kept having these murderous violent thoughts you know and i was just like really stuck in this loop of like living happy and sad happy sad happy sad happy sad until i just felt this like emptiness and this void inside of my heart it, it's it's as if like i had i was walking around with like a hole in my heart i still remember it very vividly today just nothing made me happy nothing no. you lost your friend to murder yeah he died in your arms yes when was that oh uh, that was when i got out of prison yeah so i got out and you know we had planned uh to rob a drug dealer a very well-known drug dealer in our area and um i was supposed to go to the right he was supposed to go to the left of this car um, as I go to the right, he steps in front of me. So I go to the left and he gets gunned down. And yeah, right there, he dies in my arms. Car speeds off, you know. And um, yeah, that was very, very traumatic for me, you know, to think about that. And, um, you know, have I dealt with that survivor's guilt for such a long time. And I just felt like I didn't, I didn't deserve to live. You know what I mean? So... Do you blame yourself? I do. I do. At that point, um, I 100% I took full responsibility. And, you know, I apologized to his family. Like, <sighs> I'm sorry to say, but who am I? You know what I mean? To go and tell somebody, hey, my bad, your son is dead because of me. Like, you know what I mean? I'm not God. I'm not anybody. So I, it was such a hard thing to deal with, honestly. And I drowned myself, you know, in, in alcohol and medicated, you know, doing drugs, meth, whatever I could get my hands on to like not think about it. Cause I would see him in my dreams. I would get tormented, you know, I would have him grabbing me by the ankles, you know, like Johnny, why, you know, like it was just a lot of crazy stuff, bro. And, you know, thankfully I'm free from that today, but for a very long time, I was struggling with that. Um, so see when you were making the changes in there, doing anger management, getting diplomas, what was the mindset like before you were coming out? 
mm-hmm. where you decide and like you say it's 50 50 but you know yourself if you're still 50 50 you're more likely to go back to yes. old habits was that the plan as soon as you came out or were you contemplating walking away from it because you're two strikes one more your life would off yeah and um, what was the mindset like going coming out it was <clears throat> more of like okay i'm gonna give this a shot i'm gonna try and find a job i'm gonna i'm not gonna go straight because i know as soon as i get out i have all the avenues i have the respect i have you know i can make money the day that i get out of prison basically you know um being plugged in having these different links you know but um i was like nope i'm gonna try you know and, and fly straight for a little bit i'm gonna go to my po i'm gonna you know pee in a cup i'm gonna do everything you know um and i did i did for a little bit you know a couple months um but again as i was applying to fedex you know ups home depot mcdonald's i mean shoot i uh, there's a lot of places that I applied to and um, you know that little box that says you know did you commit a crime or whatever I was honest put the crime told them everything I did two counts assault with deadly weapon um, yeah no call back no nothing I was very vengeful at that time you know I said you know I remember like looking up to the to, to, to the sky you know if there's God or Buddha or whatever why won't you let me like live I guess you want me to die so I was like F it, you know, I'm just going to go and go back to what I know. So right then and there, call the homies, plug me in. Boom, they plug me in, um, you know, maybe a month, month and a half after I'm starting to get my, my, my money up, you know, making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month now. And, and yeah, it was pretty crazy, you know. What were you doing, drugs? Selling drugs. Yeah. Yeah. White, brown, cocaine, uh, heroin? Yeah, whatever I could get my hands on honestly uh mostly white i'm stepping on bricks a lot and then um some greens you know uh, marijuana was kind of at that time was the green rush as they say but um pills i mean whatever i could push um. yeah if you're putting an application listen i always like to give everybody a chance but if you're putting an application at me with fucking kidnappings and shootings I ain't gonna fucking kill you, bro. For fuck's sake, I would have lied on that fucking. I would have had to lie on that, bro. Nobody. Part of me is thinking you put that there because you didn't want to fucking get a job. <laughs> <laughs> for fuck's sake, shootings, fucking highway shootings and kidnappings. Yeah, yeah. It's always like, yeah, come in, Johnny boy, come, <laughs> manager. Fuck that, mate. I'm ripping that up and bumbling it, mate. I don't want to see your name on an application again. <laughs> <laughs> fucking shootings and kidnappings part of me is thinking nah you knew you were never getting a job but again that method of madness you're thinking why can't I get a break why can't I get a chance yeah. life doesn't just give you a chance because Johnny decides I'm what to change yeah. life doesn't work that way you know that's yourself it's a Excellent. it's a long steady process so um, you've ended up active again Yeah, you've lost your best friend is that then do you then just become a loose cannon want to kill want to shoot Want yeah, to stop? Yeah, I was just very, I had that victimized mindset, mm-hmm. you know, that, yeah, I did these things, but um, no, one, no one cares about me. So I just, I'm not going to care about anybody else, you know, and um, that's why we planned that robbery stuff. That's why I wanted to just, it was weird. Like I couldn't live, but I couldn't die. Like I had that feeling of like, I was too afraid to die because like, you know, I, I, I kind of feared like hell. You know, and and I, I understood the concept of hell, even though I wasn't Christian at the time or even Buddhist at the time, you know, but and then I couldn't keep living because I had this depression and like emptiness. So <clears throat> I was in a state where I couldn't live, I couldn't die. And I felt like that was true misery. Like I didn't taste that until after I got out of prison. So I thought getting out of prison, I was going to feel better at least. But it, actually, it was feeling worse. And even though I was making all of that money, that was when I attempted to like take my life the most on three separate occasions. During was during that time, and and that's because I recognized that you know having money it doesn't matter. Like there was something inside of me that that I couldn't like get rid of. You know, I couldn't make money the right way like other people. I couldn't. Um, it was always like I was chasing after something and and I would reach it and then it would be like, it would level up. I'd have to get more and more and more and more. And it was just like, it was crazy. It was a never ending cycle. And I just felt like there was no point in living. And so many things happened, 
you know, in my life after that. So my friend died, you know, <clears throat> within a span of like a week and a half to two weeks, two other people who I really cared about in my life also passed away. So I started to feel this, this feeling of death, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely, my time is coming. Like you just know, you know, um, people are dying left and right in front of you. Felt like it was a sign. And um, at that point, you know, my mom actually was the one that saved my life. You know, she she found Christianity um, back in, you know, maybe four years before I got released from prison. And she was always the same thing. She went from, you know, Buddhist chanting to like, here's some Bible scriptures, here's some prayers. And I was like, what the hell is wrong with this girl? You know, she's she was Buddhist and now she's telling me that she's just going all over the place. Like, you know, I can't listen to this person. So, but she was the one that actually changed my life, I would say. Were you yeah. suicidal? Was I suicidal? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I was. Did you try and take your life three times? Yes, yes. How so? Uh, the first time was basically like, it was a mixture. It was it was um, like trying to overdose, basically. Force induced like an overdose, death, right? Death by overdose. Different drugs, hot, you know, cocktails, whatever. And then um, I tried like, you know, maybe the day after that. So I woke up. And then I did like a pill, uh, I don't know how many pills it was, like a whole big bottle full of like Tylenol. So that didn't do anything. They just pumped out, you know, pumped me out in the ER. And then um, then second time was, you know, basically trying to shoot myself. Um, and then the third time was also trying to shoot myself. My brother actually saved my life on the, on the third time without him realizing it. You know, he called uh, right when I was about to do it, you know, and... It was weird. Like he w he was getting into a, like some problems because he he was running up some kind of debt in prison, which is not a good thing. Um, and then you know he so it was weird when he called me. That it was perfect timing. Like I had all my issues and I was gonna take my life, but then he comes and he's like, "I had Joe Johnny. I need your help, bro. Move some money around. Green dot. This that." And then I'm like, I just shifted my focus onto him. And then I kind of that little bit, little shift snapped me out of everything. But yeah, on three separate occasions. Is that because the death of your best friend? Uh, <clears throat> mixture, mixture. Death of my best friend. Um, had my GED, had my anger management counseling, still felt empty. I would say a large majority would be, yeah, the death of my friend, but also emptiness. Like I couldn't get rid of my, my sadness. I'd wake up empty, bro. It's crazy, you know. Why do you think you're still alive? Uh, I think, honestly, God had a higher purpose. I never thought I would make it this far, honestly. Um, so, yeah, every time I think about that, I'm actually thankful. You know, um, I think I'm alive because God wanted to utilize my story and reach people who are also going through this. Because that's what I went viral for, was essentially just sharing my story of emptiness um you know living that up and down lifestyle that happy sad happy sad lifestyle and i think that you don't have to be a gang member to experience depression you don't have to be a gang member to experience you know trauma and things like that and we're all interconnected through that and i think that most people can can relate to me because i'm vulnerable Whereas a lot of people are still in that stage. And I went through that stage of not showing their vulnerability. So I think, yeah, my, my life is just to, at least I now is to dedicate um, to, to helping people overcome this hopelessness and emptiness and void that they feel. Like I really want to help them because the people in my life helped me overcome. And I do feel like paying it forward is like the best thing. And I'm super happy now, you know. Um, it's weird. I'm more tired. I'm traveling. We're doing this crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Send me a fucking crazy Scotsman. You've just traveled 15 hours from LA. Can't understand a word I'm saying. You're doing better off in prison, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking better off inside me. You must be thinking, what the fuck? How am I with that mad bastard? <laughs> so, so funny, bro. But yeah, so your mum clearly searching Buddhism to Christianity. It's night and day. It's, it's not not go against yeah. the beliefs. Buddhism, they don't really have a god, or you're allowed to study or 
read about other religions, do you not? Yes, yes. Did you not read the Quran I did. front to back and the Bible front to back? I did, I did. I read the front to back, uh, the back, the Bible front to back two times in prison, and I read the Quran front to back three times. I actually converted to Sunni Islam when um, Sunni Muslim uh, when I was in in prison, you know. So I did stick with the religion <clears throat> just for a little bit because I had a, a cellmate who also after that old guy moved out, um, you know, or got transferred out his points dropped and went to another prison i i kind of clicked up with this this guy um you know and he was really really cool he taught me about you know um prayer he taught me about the more the spiritual stuff you know in my life and um yeah we read it front to back bro it, he showed me the the hadith you know which is like the cliff notes you know he showed me all these different things that you have to read it with you know that he had his imams and all that but anyways yeah still even though i did all of that no no cure for the emptiness bro it was weird it was like man okay i'm doing all i'm doing this okay this is gonna be better oh and then it's kind of like a soccer game you know it's like when the side is getting close to scoring and it's like, oh, it's almost there. And then they missed the goal, you know? So I felt like my, my heart was getting pulled this back and forth, like almost like the ocean, you know, high tide, low tide, happy, sad, happy, sad. So it was just crazy. Um, as, as Buddhism, do they have a God? Buddhism? Um, they, they, they believe almost like you're your own God. I mean, they worship Buddha, even though Buddha doesn't really like want to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more of like um, mm -hmm. psychological stuff. They believe that heaven and hell is in your mind. And they don't call it heaven. They call it nirvana. You know, so they believe in reincarnation. Um, they believe in karma, you know, karm karmic debt, right? If The more good you put out into this world, the more you'll receive. And then the, the more evil you put out, the more you'll receive back as well. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really make sense to my mom. And that's why my mom changed because my mom submitted to my dad. My mom did everything, you know, was good to us, honestly, never really hit us. Um, but she had not just one kid, two kids in prison. She had an alcoholic husband. So it didn't really kind of like, you know, she didn't really do evil things. I mean, she had one person, my father, her whole life. She met him, you know, had kids with him, never cheated, never drank, never done nothing crazy. Um, so, I mean, you know, it just didn't really add up to her. And she also felt that void that I was talking about, that emptiness too. Because she's like, oh, I did everything by the book. And what's going on here? You know, so, yeah, it really tore her up inside too. You know? Do you see a lot of yourself in your mom? Oh yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. When we argue, if me and my mom argue, it's the, the my brother and my dad will go in the room like they just they can't stop us. You know, we're the same, bro. We're both very strong, very egotistical, very stubborn people. Absolutely. So when you talk about this emptiness, yeah, when did you start feeling something was making sense? Mm -hmm. What was the moment uh, when I met <clears throat> my pastor? So I had by chance taken my mom to church and you know, met this pastor and I didn't want to meet him at first, you know, it happened organically because they made food, you know, and, and this, this thing called black bean noodles. Um, and that's my favorite dish, you know? So when I got there to the church and you know, smelled the, the noodles and the pastor was cool, he wasn't put like preachy or pushy. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, there's prison chaplains in prison. There's Catholics in prison, you know, there's, um, apostolics that come in and they were honestly pretty like preachy very pushy as well like they acted nice at first but they're like you know kind of trying to push their religion onto you saying that you need to repent saying that if you don't you'll go to hell you know just stuff like that and i didn't want to hear stuff like that you know and then they would say it would they would always finish it with oh because we love you we're telling you <laughs> what's gonna happen to you you know and i'm like so you're telling me i'm gonna burn in hell because you love me that's crazy you know but he didn't do that he was more like oh you know we got some noodles do you want to you know, take it, take it home. And being Asian, we don't do that. Like if you're going to prepare something for us, we have to at least come to your house, sit down, enjoy it with you, compliment you, whatever. So yeah, I went in, sat down with him and he started to essentially show me like my heart in front of me. Like, and what I mean by that is he was able to dissect my heart and show me a man who I don't, I didn't know lived a completely opposite life than I did. He was a pastor's kid, 
right? He grew up in the church. He was saved at 19 years old, basically, and he just lived his whole life as a as preaching the gospel. It, from Korea, doesn't know anything about the LA gang culture, politics, none of that. But yet, he was telling me for the first time why I was feeling empty. He was essentially peeling back the layers of the onion for me and getting to the root issue. And that was crazy. Like, And I noticed that he was just wise. Like, He spoke in a way where I understood everything that he was saying. He was explaining to me just why I, I was the way I was. And it was actually normal. Whereas everyone, even myself, was telling me, no, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. You're not the same as other people. You're violent. You're this, you're that. And that's why you should just continue living the way that you live because you're going to die anyways. You know, he was showing me that my thoughts, my own thoughts were deceiving me. And he said, all thoughts are not our thoughts. That's what he said. And I'm like, whoa, I never thought about that because I used to think if I'm thinking my own thoughts, they're from me but not necessarily. So he was able to show me all of this. And um, yeah, I was able to really trust this person right off bat. Yeah, because when you're taking advice, even for your elders in mm -hmm. prison, that guy's in for a double murder. He's a <laughs> fucking psychopath. So even though you're taking advice, he's still not that smart. First of all, he's got caught as well. So <laughs> it's the method of thinking that we think, oh, he's a good guy. He's trying. Listen, people make mistakes and I, I believe people who have been an addict, it's then easier to help people who right. are struggling them for people who was an addict maybe sure. changed their life it's see instead of the people who's learned from books and yeah, yeah. they try and guide people they've never really lived it they've not got that key ingredient yes. to then show people so if the guy's done murders i get it if he's, he's made changes but you're still speaking with psychopaths yeah. <laughs> then you've got a clean living man yeah. but it kind of is that when it made all it made sense yeah what yeah. you were searching for you kind of got some answers yes yes how yes. old were you uh, at that time, I had gotten out of prison. I probably was out for like maybe eight months. So almost a year. So what, 20, 25? 25 years old. Still a kid. How hard is that to get out these gangs though? Oh, it's hard. It's hard, you know. But but again, I, I you know, you it goes back to the question of when you said, you know, why do you think you're alive? You know, I'm in a very special uh, point in my life and a very special position. Um, I never had to drop out of my gang, which is a beautiful thing. You know, um, you know, my family's in it. My brother's still in it. Um, a lot of my, my family members are in it. So I never had to really like denounce them because even if I denounce them, I can't stop being my brother's younger brother, my uncle's, you know, nephew, this and that. So when I thought about it, like, God has, at least I credit this to God, is that he allowed me to be in this position where they support me. My friends, my, my, my gang member friends, they actually support me. You know, they see my interviews, they're probably going to see this one. And they cheer me on, it's crazy, you know. And I think it's because um, they know that I'm not here to glorify anything, that I'm truly changed. And even my older homies, you know, they teach me too. Like, yeah, the younger generation that's coming in, guide them correctly you know like i mean we're all in a gang f because we're all broken people you know you don't join a gang just because you know i don't think normal people join gangs like as you say there's this there's has to be that level of like psychopath right but uh at the same time it's really just broken human beings coming together and finding some kind of solace being in the midst of chaos together you know so um they never really um, denounced you, you know, or, or rejected me and they support everything that I do and that's something that a lot of people can't say there's a lot of people who are ex-gang members who are like casted out who are exiled out who are still till this day looking over their shoulders because you know I've seen people get put in the dirt you know murdered for speaking on camera and things like that you know but they I found a sweet spot where they they accept me and they allow me to do that and they know that I'm just telling my story and my message um and what helped me and they see people I'll be out with my friends sometimes to go eat and stuff and people will walk up yo you're Johnny Chang bro let me get a photo and you know the the big homies they all see they're like man that's what it's about bro that's what's up you know so they're very like supportive it's it's crazy you know, yeah, you know. but I feel as if you probably earned your stripes anyway yeah. by being in prison from the ages of 12 and of nearly 15 years without snitching. So sure. they probably knew you were clean cut, good guy, loyal, yeah. or else you would be fucking dead. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting on camera and yeah. you know with yourself, people think that's snitching. Yeah. And there's some people speak 
too much out of school for me. Of course. And and, and obviously, look at the guy who, the two-pack murder. Yeah, yeah. He's fucking sitting on a podcast saying he was there that night. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it was 25 years ago, 100 yeah. years ago. Yeah. The, the books are still open for you to get a case. Yeah. And it's just how it comes back and bites you in the ass. But yeah. I feel as if, with podcasts now, I feel as if everybody thinks that you're... F- you're eliminated for some yeah. old court case. It doesn't work that way. No. A lot of people speak themselves into an indi- indictment. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And there's no statute of limitation for things like that, murder and things like that. Yeah. You know? So crazy. Yeah. So your mum changed. She'd found what she was searching for. You then meet the pastor. But one of the most defining moments in your life was when the pastor told you to speak to your dad. Yeah. So my, <clears throat> so after everything, you know, my pastor was basically explaining to me that you're normal, that, you know, he used a lot of analogies, essentially, um, you know, that like a house, for example, he said, when you look at a house and it gets vandalized, you know, do you blame the house, you know, for being van- it's having its windows broken, having it graffitied on? No, of course not. Uh, you blame the vandal. Well, likewise, you know, he showed me a Bible verse in Romans chapter 7, basically telling us that we hate doing the things that we do. So my father hates drinking, but he keeps on doing it because there's something inside of him that's leading him to do it. This vandal, right? Which is sin. So um, that I, re- I, I really resonated with that because I also, when I would rob people or do evil things, like... Outwardly, it looked like I was doing it, but inside I would question, now, why did I do that? What the hell is wrong with me? Do I have no remorse whatsoever for people to just go up to them and stick them up, pistol whip them, bust their head open, you know, like crazy stuff. And then just for this paper, basically, you know, that I have to keep, you know, chasing after. And I just really had a lot of regret too. So it's weird when I, when pastor put it in that perspective, I was able to humanize my father. And he said, your father is like a house and he's getting vandalized every day but you're blaming outwardly him the house you have to blame the vandal and he said you too johnny you've been vandalized all your life by these intrusive thoughts by this evil destructive voice and it really put in perspective for me to humanize my own father who i thought if i if he died i would be happy you know and i i don't know it was weird like pity compassion started to flow inside of my heart And I started to feel bad for my dad for the first time in my life. Whereas before that, it was all rage and anger. I hated him. And um, that's when he said, now that you understand, I want you to apologize to your father. And I thought that was crazy. You know, victim apologizing to the aggressor. Doesn't matter if it's in Scotland, America, you don't do that. You know, the the person who's at fault has to apologize. But um, he made it very clear that because I was right, I was also miserable. And he's he was right. Again, he was pulling my card, you know, he's calling my bluff, you know. He was basically seeing what was inside of my heart that everywhere I went, I carried this burden of victim, like I'm a victim. And I carried this burden of I'm lonely and depressed because I didn't have a good father. And really, bro, I would go on the streets, see people who had like their own fathers hugging on them, buying them food. And I felt like this rage inside of my heart, but also sadness and just this roller coaster of emotion and just being angry immediately because somebody had a loving father and I didn't. And I don't know why I didn't deserve that. You know, I didn't ask to be born, but why didn't I have a father? Why wasn't I born to a father who could take care of me? And um, so he was, again, able to show my heart like a mirror. You know, this is what you feel. And I know, and I want to free you from that. I have the antidote to free you from this. And And he said, the antidote is apologizing and being wrong. And I'm like, what the hell? That's crazy. And he used one analogy that really made sense and pushed me forward was he said, if you think about the war, right? People who go to war, for example, it's because both sides believe that they're right and they're fighting for something they believe that they're right. They're even willing to die for it. So when that happens, telephone lines, you know, communication, water, everything is broken down. The society breaks down. There's chaos everywhere because they're bombing each other. Buildings are collapsing, right? But when one side, like it, it gives up, right? One side 
loses and says they're sorry essentially then that's when the roads are rebuilt you know peace is, is starts to flow into this these countries likewise johnny you're right and your father's also right so two right people they're clashing right now if you learn to say that you're sorry then peace i believe by faith he said peace will flow into your guys's relationship and it was weird it kind of oddly made sense at that time so i was like okay i'll do it i made the determination in my heart i'm gonna do that so i apologized to my father and uh, when i apologized to him you know told him that hey dad i'm sorry for being a bad son i'm sorry for being in a gang i'm sorry that i ruined your dreams of coming to america and living the american dream um and he started just crying and he's like, I'm sorry, son. It wasn't even you. It was me. I was a bad father. I was abusive. I couldn't carry, you know, handle my drinking. And we just hugged it out. After that, 20 years of pain was gone. I mean, we have a great relationship now. And all that was due to a short Korean pastor <laughs> telling me, um, go and say sorry to your father and see what happens by faith. And after that, I just really, my life started to upgrade after that, you know. When are you at your happiest? When I unlock that trauma for people. So sharing my stories like this, having people come up to me and tell me, hey, Johnny, you don't even know, listening to your story, I did exactly what you did to my mom or my father. And then them rekindling, like, it really brings me joy inside of my heart. You know, and, and it's it's so peaceful. So I'm most happy when I see other people um, just being unlocked from that, that prison of like, that emotional and mental prison of like, you know, just, just emptiness and void. You know, when they're free from that, it's such a beautiful thing. It like, it makes me just be thankful for everything, you know. So did you turn to Christ then? Yeah. The yeah. Bible? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And what was that feeling when you, a gangbanger shooting people stabbing people yeah. to then turn to christ and then talking about religion how were you treated by the people you did grow up did a lot of people turn their back on you as well at first they did at first they couldn't understand they're like yo this guy this guy is saying that he's righteous you know they looked at me like i was a psychopath you know johnny if you're righteous then we're all righteous because you were you were the worst of the worst none of they would make jokes none of us went to prison at 12 years old you know so you're bad you know and how can you say and they would laugh at me at first but it's funny because the more I grew and my peace grew, I feel like God led by example through my life. You know, now the homies come to me for everything. Hey, Johnny, I'm fighting with my girl. Uh, can you give me a Bible verse, you know, or something that, can you give me advice, you know? And I'm kind of like the anchor and the pillar when people feel this emptiness and they don't have that emotional maturity or spiritual maturity or self-awareness they'll come and ask me and then i'll unlock it for them you know so it went from like yeah this guy this is a phase this guy's believing in god and they all do this they come out of prison and they think they find god but um i'm actually able to help them a lot of them come to my church i mean it's a beautiful thing yeah how do you feel now happy all the time bro it's crazy it's like very peaceful you know um whereas everything i remember was chaotic um, up and down, you know, life's a roller coaster. I feel very base now, very just calm, peaceful. I don't trip anymore. Like people, you know, if anything, I'm getting more flack nowadays because people know me from the past. Ah, oh, don't listen to him. He's a little fake church boy because he shot, he shot at my family. And, you know, these things resurface. But for me, I'm still peaceful about these things. Like I've made peace with the fact that I've done those things. Yes. But it wasn't, I feel like it wasn't me. Um, I feel like, you know, I really trusted in myself and therefore those thoughts that came in allowed me to live very evil. Um, I don't feel like that defines who I am now. You know, who I am now is completely different than the Johnny just 10 years ago, you know? So um, I'm very thankful for that. And, yeah. you know, and people don't forget, and we get them. You've done evil things. <clears throat> people will never forget no matter how yeah. well you do no matter how many lives you save no matter how much you change how do you deal with that when you're on a good path you're on a righteous path to do the right things in life people are calling you a psychopath yeah when you're reading the bible yeah they were fucking think you were normal when you were shooting at people that's how fucking deluded people yeah. are that like, back in the day when i was doing my shit i was fucking off my head and coke yeah. and booze yeah yeah 
And then I'd done like a Reiki course, which is like healing energy. Yeah, yeah. I grew a fucking top knot. Yeah. <laughs> and I, st I stand in, in this like, living room with six different women yeah. with my little fucking certificate to say I was a Reiki master. <laughs> and the comments are thinking, he's lost his fucking head. Look at the state of him. He's, 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 he's this and that. People thought I was more fucking crazy then right. when I was, when I was fucking crazy right. back then. Right. It's crazy how, I've just said crazy like five fucking times, <laughs> but it's people's method of thinking. It just, every, everything's levels, spirituality, vibrations. Sure. You were at the bottom. Yeah. The lowest vibration, the darkest, the seediest, the most chaotic. Sure. There's not, like you say, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. So how do you deal with it now? Because everybody, no matter how much you change, you've still got that, that element of crazy is still of fucking course. there. Of course. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. But people always like to poke the bear. Of course. But how do you deal with that now? You're in a better place, headspace, you don't yeah. need to react. What's your advice? Yeah, I don't take it personally. I feel like everyone's going to have an opinion and those opinions aren't mm -hmm. even their opinions um, because opinions change too. The beautiful thing about the heart and feelings, where the heart come, where the feelings come from, the heart, it changes you know, like one day you could be mad. Like, for example, I was a gang member. I thought I was going to die from my gang. I don't feel like that anymore. You know, and I remember no one could talk me out of that. No one could talk me out of, you know, not snitching. You know, I knew people who were like, just snitch, bro. Like, I mean, you don't even have to do time. Just just point these people out. And I was like, no, I won't do it. So, you know, I, I really changed a lot because the heart changes you know so yes there's people who come in some people in my bible study who who when they first saw my video they they tell me straight up oh you're you have you know tattoos you have these types of tattoos that symbolize murder and, and your gang and everything and yeah you're talking about christianity you're psycho but the funny thing is they say the more that they listen to me they start to recognize like dang like this guy actually has a point you know and they start to change as well so i i look at it as like any type of ridicule that comes is just an opportunity for people to to kind of like get used to you and experience you and uh, really kind of open their mind. You know, it's it's a chance for them to open their mind. I don't take it as combative. I t even if it's a mean comment, I take it more as like, damn, that's sad. Because what they're doing is they're on here and they're missing the whole message because they can't get out of that mindset of judging people and like, you know, and it's almost like I've accepted that you're either damned if you do or damned if you don't. <laughs> if I'm reading the Bible, like you say, they're going to think I'm crazy. If I'm shooting people, they're going to think I'm crazy. So I don't live for people. And I feel like people's opinions only matter to people. It doesn't matter to me, you know, and I've gotten to that point where I've acknowledged who I am. Yeah, if I trust Johnny again, tomorrow I can go and pick up a gun and start shooting people. I know that, that there's a difference, you know, whereas people try to push that away. I know that if I believe in myself again and I trust those intrusive thoughts, you know, then I can go back to it. And I use the analogy of like a trash, a garbage, you know, trash can. Um, trash inside of the garbage is not an issue right inside of your mind as well those thoughts staying inside is okay it's when the trash comes out it's over the couch over the bed on the floor out of that's when it becomes an issue right likewise my thoughts if i'm not reacting off of that and it's not coming out as action it's not a problem these are just fleeting thoughts they'll come they'll go they'll come they'll go and so yeah maybe i might get mad sometimes i'm reading a comment and they're putting all my information out there i saw a comment last time you know recently where they're like look at johnny you know he's acting all calm and you know he's all famous now but you know he he shot you know his gang and him you know hit me multiple times you know hit my family hurt put us through a lot you know, and, and this is all his, like, they're putting my information, court case information, everything. And the first thought was rage, you know, I was like, man, what the fuck? Like this guy, why are they doing this? You know, why are they putting all this information out there? You know, don't they see that we're doing a positive thing? But I just kind of sat on it and I was like, oh yeah, those are my impulsive initial thoughts. I'm not going to trust those thoughts. It's okay. You know, they have a right as much <clears throat> as I do to say and speak, you know, and that's what they want to put out there. I mean, it's not like they're lying. It's true what they were writing in that comment, you know? And then I had noticed that it had gotten removed, you know, but I was like, okay, cool, you know? So I just kind of leave everything like, 
you know, up to the hands of God, if you will. Yeah, you because know? you still need to accept the bad shit that you've done. It of doesn't course. disappear because Johnny's changed. Of course. What's the hardest part about change, Johnny? What's the hardest thing about change? For me, it was always the conscience hmm. telling you and remembering you, like you say, when you do change, you realise the world is a good place, there's good things happen, but yeah. there was a conscience that says, just because you've changed, the, the pain is still there. So yeah. here's a little reminder of that, because when you block everything out, <clears throat> it's easy not to feel, yeah. it's easy to be selfish, sure, it's easy to sure. cut everything off, but that's a lonely journey. That's yeah. where the loneliness comes in for me, because you've blocked everything off, because you don't want to feel the pain that you're causing, because yeah. you know deep inside it's wrong, but you're too afraid to admit it. Every sure. gang banging, every gangster, every drug lord, everybody who I've interviewed who think they're serious, it's because they're broken, yeah. it's because they're scared. Yes. And now it obviously takes you many, many years to realise that, but for you, what was the main thing, the hardest thing about change? Um, I think was, yeah, coming to the conclusion and acknowledging yourself for who, who you really were. Like, that was who we were, you know what I mean? And, and that can still be who you are, depending on if you trust and believe yourself. So I, I feel like when I trust my thoughts, when I follow myself, like, just like I followed myself to join a gang, just like I followed myself to sell drugs, like, you know, I didn't, I, I had different options i didn't have to join a gang you know but i thought that that was what was good in my eyes at that point i've learned that that's the biggest struggle even now is making my own decisions and like not surrendering fully to god so i would say that's a that's a struggle you know but every time that i do surrender you know and and you know, people say, if you, okay, Johnny, if you don't trust yourself, who, who do you, who can you trust? And that's why I read the Bible is because I start to get a lot of wisdom from that, you know? And, um, it's weird. The more I've trusted other people instead of myself, like my pastor or like the Bible, my life has upgraded. My peace has grown. Um, whereas before, if I trusted myself, you know, um, I was I was just miserable all the time, living destructively. So I think, um, honestly, the biggest struggle even now is just like that consciousness of like, I'm right and I know what's right. And I have to kind of struggle with that every day. It's a daily battle where it's like, this makes sense to me, but then I have to check myself and be like, but but also selling drugs made sense to me. Robbing a drug dealer and, and, and coming up off of $100,000 at once also made sense to me, cost my friend his life though. So I have to also find that intricate balance of, am I gonna trust myself today or am I gonna trust you know the word of God? And that's kind of been the struggle with the change that I've dealt with. Is your dad still drinking? No, he's, 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 he's done completely. Um, he's comes to church too, it's crazy. He comes to church, he's done drinking, um, doesn't beat my mom anymore, it's crazy. It's kind of weird, they go on dates i'm just like yo this is not they they like you know kiss each other and hold hands and i'm like what the heck is going on right now you know but same thing he was also saved uh through the same pastor that helped me because he noticed a change in me he's like okay johnny's not throwing parties anymore he's not carrying a gun anymore like what the hell is, what's wrong with my son he noticed the peace as well he noticed that i wasn't arguing with him or anything crazy not getting physical with him so he went to my church <laughs> he asked the pastor straight up what did you do to my son you know what made him so calm you know and then he preached the gospel pastor preached the gospel to my dad and he received salvation too. You know, my dad was drinking a lot because he, in his, you know, teens, like uh, late teens, he uh, he actually ran over somebody, he killed somebody. And he also had survivor's guilt, you know, and, and I didn't know that, you know, so he was trying to drown himself out as well. He drown out all that emotion, block it all out. And he used the medium of, of a soju bottle, you know, alcohol. And um, yeah, now that I think about it, how sad, you know, I was judging this man outwardly, not understanding that he was also struggling with inner demons. He was broken completely. And he didn't share that with anybody. He never shared that with me. I, I don't think he even shared that with my mom, honestly. Or maybe he did, but my mom didn't share it with us, you know? So yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, but shame and guilt are powerful. Like <clears throat> you talk about Buddhism, the circle of life. Yeah. <clears throat> I read a book called Many Lives, Many Masters. Mm. It talks about if you don't fix your problems this life, you come back again with the same problems and they add another one on. Like, wow. <clears throat> all my dad's uncles were murdered. Yeah. 
all my uncles, were murdered. My mum's lost two brothers to murder, and it kind of seemed as if it was the same spiral, wow. yeah, yeah. same sort of same as you and your dad. Yeah. Your dad seen somebody die, he's living with that pain. He yeah. intoxicated himself and all the external negatives. Yeah. You've done the same. You've seen your best friend get killed. Yeah. You've hid from the pain. People who drink and take drugs is a weakness. They're weak. Yeah. They're not big men. People drink and take drugs to for fake confidence, yeah, fake high, suppress the feelings, suppress the emotions. It's bullshit. Yeah. So it's like the full circle where, and then you've healed it, you've broke whatever connection has been in your family. Whether sure. Some people say it's curse. Some people say it's reincarnation, come back to relive sure. and fix the problems. Like, do you see that connection mm. of being like your dad also as much as being like your mum? For sure. 100%. You know, that's that's what the pastor told me was you're exactly the same as your dad. And that kind of put a like a sour taste in my mouth. I'm like, no, I, I don't beat women. You know, I don't drink like him, you know, but um, my heart was like his. We were both hurt and struggling inside. And he just went the medium of alcohol and I went the route of violence and, and gangbanging. But it's still the same trauma. It's still the same hurt. We were still interconnected. And again, that's how I was able to humanize him and realize that, damn, I'm actually very similar to my father in that way then, if you put it in that way. I just never seen it from that perspective ever. So I was very thankful towards him. And yeah, I agree with that. You know, We're so similar. And to hate him would mean that I have to hate myself, honestly, you know. It's like mirror image. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So see, when you started speaking out and stuff, how was that feeling? Were you nervous or, or did you just believe it was your calling? Uh, I was nervous at first. Uh, just like you, we had touched up on, I didn't want to share this stuff. This is stuff that I'm putting myself out there for millions of people to see. Like, I mean... The software Underbelly got like almost 7 million views. On top of that, there's all these other platforms that I went viral on, Flat TV and, you know, all these other places. And um, But I learned that, you know, just sharing your story, uh, it really gives hope to a lot of people. Yeah, there's going to be people, the naysayers, the judgmental people. Sure, sure. But I'm not living for those people. You know, I I know so many people now who are like, bro, your your testimony, you know, changed my life. So um, at first, yes, it was hard. At first, I was like, you know, why am I going to these prisons? My pastor's like, Johnny, you should go to these prisons. You should become an international chaplain, ordained minister um, to share. And I'm like, hell no. You know, my thoughts were like telling me, don't do that. It's embarrassing. You're weak. You know, you go in there and people, you may see some of the people, you very people you hurt. Imagine you're teaching a class, you know, and you hurt that person that's in your class. Like how stupid, how hypocritical are you? But the funny thing is my pastor, that's why he's a wise man. He said, Johnny, it's crazy that Satan is planting these thoughts in you. And I'm like, Satan's planting thoughts inside of me. How do you know? You know, he said, you know, when you're doing lines of Coke and you're drinking, he was never like, oh, you need to stop doing this. He was like, wow, this is amazing. This is life. You got to continue. But now that you're going to actually go and help people, he gives you nervousness. He gives you this anxiety. He gives you this, oh, if you go in there, you know, they may kidnap you and stab you because that also happens in these prisons, you know, um, and he's, it's like, wow, Satan all of a sudden wants to really protect your life. You know, uh, it, have you thought about that? And with that, I was able to deny my thoughts and move forward. And the crazy thing is I still remember first time I went to prison, it was in Lancaster State Prison, the very, my, my original stomping grounds, my alma mater, as they say. Um, and I went in there and there was a group of 37 people, inmates. <clears throat> and this was back, you know. Uh, like like 2017, something like that. And I started to preach. I just gave my testimony, taught the courses. And at first I was like, dang, these guys, you know, they're going to think I'm stupid. You know, I walk in there, I stick out like a sore thumb. You know, they're looking at me. They're like, what the hell is this guy doing here? You know, he's he looks like he needs to be in one of our uniforms, you know. But um, so they see me once I finish my my um you know, my class, they walk up to me and they start like shaking my hand. They start to open up. Oh, you know, I'm in here for double murder. And that's, people never talk about that. If you're in prison, you don't talk about your murders. You don't talk about your cases, basically. They're opening up and they're like, hey, bro, that emptiness that you felt, I feel that right now. So like, they start to kind of like, you know, it was a beautiful thing. I was able to help them. And now I'm doing this full-time prison ministry, full-time. Um, 
And I just, I realized like, man, what if I followed those thoughts? What if I was like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm okay. No, I, I'm a gangster. I don't talk on camera. <laughs> Let's say, you know, how many people I, would I be able to really help? I, I don't think as much as I could. So I was, I was, pastor was teaching me to deny my thoughts, mm -hmm. you know, and move forward boldly. And that's what I do nowadays, you know, so. So life is good now. Life is great. <laughs> Honestly, it's great. And I, I'm undeserving of it. And I know that, you know, but I'm also very thankful, you know, that I'm, I'm able to help. And however long I'm I'm living, this is just what I want to do, you know. And otherwise, I wouldn't jump on a plane, you know, and come <laughs> and speak to me. You're probably thinking, I don't even know that cunt. Fuck's <laughs> <laughs> sake, mate. Maybe you're losing your fucking head, mate. Maybe you're still fucking psychotic, mate. Who jumps on a plane from LA to come and speak to a Scotsman? Right. <laughs> I don't think you've changed, Johnny. Right. Your friends are right, mate. You're still off your right. fucking head. <laughs> Wait, how important? How important is belief? Because I believe in a higher power. I don't know what the creator is. Sure. There's so many gods and so many <coughs> religions. I understand that. And sure. I'm not here to discredit any of them because I'm not educated enough sure, to know. Sure, so sure. I love Buddhism beliefs. Um, I've dipped my toe into Christianity. I was raised a Catholic. Yeah. But I believe there's a higher power. Sure. Whoever, the creator, whoever's created us, the mind and how it functions, it blows my mind. But sure. how important is it for you and belief to have something to believe in? I think it's very important. You know, I think... Um, it's there's this piece when you can kind of place the responsibility on understanding that there is a higher power. Um, I believe all religions teach you to do well. There's no religion that blatantly just tells you, hey, go out and just do evil things. For me personally, Christianity was the religion that lifted me out and taught me that you can't do it without a savior. We call him our savior so because he has to save us from some something. You know, I, I, I liken it to like somebody who's drowning, for example. If I'm in the middle of the ocean and I'm drowning, um, I doesn't matter how much I try to swim, I'm going to die. I don't know how to swim, right? I'm drowning. Um, so I need a lifeguard to come and save me and put me back on land. Likewise, I was drowning in my depression, drowning in my misery, drowning in my just loneliness and emptiness and i feel like god was the only one you know jesus was able to save me when he told me that hey you're righteous you're holy your thoughts are all evil don't trust those thoughts all other religions even you know within you know quran within muslim with buddhism it's all your kind of your own master almost you write the faith you know you 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 are the author almost you know you make a decision and your deeds outweigh <clears throat> you know your good deeds outweigh the bad deeds you know and that's kind of the system of like working you know but uh for christianity true christianity it's all about grace yeah you don't deserve it johnny but somebody came and lifted you out of it and that type of love is a it's a different type of love you know so i was able to experience true love through that and that's why i never push it onto people i'm never like oh you guys need to do this it's like you have to come to that conclusion and and realize that, you know, if it's based off of humans who are imperfect, um, I don't think we can ever re reach a level of perfection, you know, because we're already flawed from birth. So we need something that's perfect to kind of save us. And that's just how I explain it to people, mm -hmm. you know, and they're always shocked. Like, why at all the religions, you know, Hindu, thousands of gods, you know, this and that. I'm like, I mean, because the ones that I did study, I didn't study all the religions. But for the most part, you can see that it's really based off of you. It's at least a 50-50 work. It's like, okay, God did what he did, you know, but you, you also have to put in your work. But it's like, how do I put in the work of God on his level? Like, I, I can't do it. And when I recognize I couldn't do it, that's when he did everything for me. When I recognized that I was nothing and I had no other way, that's when he became everything and he was the way, right? So it was kind of like really crazy how that all came together. Mm -hmm. But I had to get to that position. Um, otherwise, I was continuously trying and failing, trying and failing, and trying mm -hmm. and failing. So the biggest religions in the world, you've got Muslim, yeah. Christianity, Buddhism. What's the one verse that sticks out? What's the one thing that sticks out in your mind that makes sense the most? Um, for me, I would say Hebrews 10, 14, uh, the verse that says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever 
them that are sanctified. So why that stuck out and why that saved my life um, is because it says one offering, which is Jesus Christ, died for our sins. We know that. And then it says perfected, which is in past tense, which I always thought was weird, you know, perfected, meaning already completed, already perfect forever means eternally because there's nothing forever in this world we know that too and then it says them that are sanctified which is made holy are sanctified made holy my thoughts though told me no i'm not holy i'm not perfect i'm evil so i need to you know i'm flawed right i need to like continuously live this cycle of sin repent happy sad but when i threw away my thoughts and i leaned on to this word it changed my life. Like now when my thoughts come in, cause there's always cravings, you know, this is a drug, you know, you, oh, I need a drink today. Oh, I got, I want to do a line of Coke. Like that'll just level me out today, you know? But when those thoughts come, I lean on that word. No, no, no. I'm not that old person anymore. I'm perfected. I'm a new creature. I'm somebody who's, you know, sanctified, holy already. Um, I think that's where a lot of people can't get out of that hole that they're stuck in. As soon as that thought comes up, they have to then manage that thought. We don't manage our thoughts. I learned to forsake my thoughts. No, I'm not going to trust this thought. I'm going to lean on the word. And of course, if you don't know the Bible and you're not well-versed, then it's like, uh, a person, a street fighter trying to fight Mike Tyson or like Floyd Mayweather, you're going to lose every single time, right? Satan is very cunning. He's very smart. If you don't know how to v fight that spiritually with the verses, you're going to lose every time. So that's why I read the Bible front to back 21 times. It's not because I want to read and I'm crazy. It's because I know if I don't have this weaponry, if I don't have this arsenal of verses to counteract my thoughts, I'm not even going to make it this far. You mm -hmm. know, I would fall into my misery, you know, so, yeah. Where do you go forward for the future, Johnny? Honestly, I let God just lay it all out, right? Like, I don't know if it's going to be more podcasts, you know? Um, I don't know if it's going to be more public speaking, keynote speaking. I don't really care. Honestly, I just want to help people. And I think that's what's good about, you know, what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm trying to just help people. So whatever way it is, I do Bible studies, private Bible studies, one-on-one -on -one counseling. I counsel a lot of influencers, ex-strippers, current strippers, OnlyFans people, porn stars, whoever. And I help everybody. So for me, I'm just like, whatever, God, you know, whatever it is, you know, if he wants to, again, fly me out to out here, you know, <laughs> I'm like, let's do it. You know, I'm game for everything. So I just go wherever I feel like God allows, them. yeah. But why do you think so many people are broken? Why do you think so many people are lost? Because obviously we've got drink, we've got drugs, we've got porn, sure. we've got so many things from the, the day we're born, everything's labels and yeah. religions, you're given a name. And yeah. I've been speaking about this, we're going to cut the umbilical cord too sure. soon. And yeah. a lot of mothers don't breastfeed, which is bad for abandonment issues. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. <clears throat> we're kind of lost and flawed from a, a very young age. But yes. what do you think it is? for now that you've spoke to so many broken souls yeah. what do you think i'll be honest it's it, it starts with just not understanding the core nature of who they are who people are i mean it goes back to the bible i mean it tells us that we're born evil right we're born flawed because of sin so me for example i'm chinese you know, I didn't choose to be Chinese, right? I was born this way. Why? Because my father, his father, so on and so forth. Likewise, if you believe in Christianity, um, Adam was a sinner. So when he birthed Cain, also another sinner. Sin, 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 passed down all the way to us. So we're born evil. That's why you have to teach kids to do good. You know, you have to teach them to not cry. You have to teach them to not be selfish because naturally it's part of us. And yet, if you notice this world, what does it teach you? It teaches you trust yourself, believe in yourself, follow your heart. But the thing is, when you trust yourself, who's imperfect and flawed, then broken things start to happen. You know, so what I feel like people need to learn is not to trust yourself. You have to actually learn to trust in something that's higher than you, that is perfect, that is better than you. But so much of social media, so much of this world in general is teaching just like individualism. No, you're the master. You do what you want to do. And sure, people do what they want to do. But 
a lot of people, because they did what they wanted to do, they're miserable. Did everything you thought and every thought that you, that came to you, did it come to like fruition? Was it perfectly as you thought it would be? Of course not. We had to bend a lot. We had to change our mindset. We had to, you know, do all that. And it's because our thought, it's proof that our thoughts are not always correct. But the issue is we're all deceived into thinking that if I just follow what I want and follow my heart, then I'll, I'll be happy. And every person that I see that's broken, it's all because they had that mindset of like, I'm going to be the master and I'm going to do what I want to do. Just like me. I wanted to join a gang. I'm not doing no homework. That didn't make me happy. I'm going to do, I'm going to join a gang and I'll make money. That's what I'm going to do. And it led me to misery and it led me and everyone around me was miserable because I made that decision. You know, um, just like my dad's like, I'm going to drink. And it made everyone around him miserable too. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he wasn't planning, like, I'm going to have a wife and I want to beat the crap out of her and, you know, you know, beat my, my kids and who I brought into this world. Like he never contemplated that. It just started with, oh, this is how I'm going to self-medicate. This will make me feel better. It's a way for me to block out what I did. Mm -hmm. And it started with that little thought and it just escalated to him being a monster. Likewise, that little thought entered me and I became a monster after that, you know, so, yeah. For anybody watching, Johnny, that's in that life of struggle, sure. maybe feeling broken and lost, what advice would you have for them? Uh, yeah. I would say that, number one, you're not alone. I don't think that, you know, it's a problem to be broken. You know, we, we're, we're, we're naturally flawed as human beings. And just to bring it all full circle, you know, if we learn to maybe think about our thoughts i know that sounds crazy but think about all the decisions you made and then what led you to where you're at you'll recognize that 90 percent of it was because you trusted this mindset of i'm going to do what i want to do and no one else is going to tell me otherwise but um, when you have that type of mindset you can't learn from people if you think you're right all the time you can't learn from anybody so we have to come to this position of I'm not right all the time. And let's hear what other people have to say. That's why we have mentors. That's why, you know, people who are right all the time, if you notice, they're, they're very isolated. Nobody wants to be around somebody who's right all the time. You know, they don't take advice. They're very stubborn, push everybody away. Uh, we have to learn to kind of like hear people out. And so I would tell them that, you know, if you're living in that life where everyone is saying you're wrong and everyone is like kind of distancing themselves from you, we do have to do a lot of self-reflection and recognize that, hey, maybe it's because I always thought I was right and I don't listen to anybody. And as hard as that sounds, if you recognize that and just acknowledge that today, you can actually start to heal. And I think um, relationships will be rebuilt. I think um, happiness will start to flow into your heart and peace is the byproduct of, of that. You know. What's your greatest life lesson, Johnny, since being on this planet? <clears throat> greatest life lesson was... Um, not following everything that arises inside of my heart. So what I mean by that is not reacting to my everything that I feel because feelings come and go. So like if I feel angry, it doesn't, it's not going to be forever. No one stays angry all the time and no one stays happy all the time. This is part of life. Uh, whereas a lot of people try to shift it where they just be happy all the time. And it's like this la la land. It's okay to feel emotions. I think that's the biggest thing. And, and people don't want to feel that there's times where you have to feel empty. There are times where you have to feel pain because it's just like working out, you know, no pain, no gain, right? We don't learn anything from success meaning just being happy all the time. If anything, success breeds complacency, right? It's when we fail, that's when we learn everything. You know, we learn not to move this way, not to make this business decision. So failure is really a beautiful thing, right? It's ne necessary for growth. Yes, failure brings pain. But to say that I don't want to feel pain anymore, I don't want to fail anymore, is the same thing as saying I don't want to grow anymore. And that's something that nobody would want to say. Everyone wants to grow and hit these new highs and different levels. So the, the greatest lesson for me would be embracing the pain of failure. Because when you embrace it, it no longer has dominion over you. It actually, you can weaponize it. You can use it to actually grow.
and that's how I see it. Yeah. Listen, Johnny, for coming all the way from LA to tell your story, yes, you're nothing but a legend, bro. I'm proud of you for every positive you've made in your life, Thank turning you. it from the negative to the positive. It's unbelievable. You're doing God's work, whoever God is, trying to help people, trying to help people from not making the same mistakes you did. And even if they have made those mistakes, they're changing. Your dad's prime example, your prime example. Sure. He's a clearly here for a reason. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Um, no, I think that's good, bro. We touched up on everything. <laughs> I'm proud Thank of you. you Look forward to seeing you again. And I Absolutely. wish you nothing but the best for the future, bro. Likewise, God bro. God bless you, brother. God bless.